Cam Rising is coming back to Utah, and he's already one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play at the university, but where exactly does he rank all time, and what is his ceiling after 2024? Let's discuss on today's Locked On Utes. You are Locked On Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Locked On Utes your first listen every single day. We are available on all platforms, including YouTube and wherever you may get your podcasts. If this is your first time listening to our show, make sure you like and subscribe. Love interacting with all of you in the YouTube comments as well as on social media, where you can follow our show on X at Locked On Utes. Today's episode of Locked On Utes is brought to you by Game Time. You can download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On. That's all caps, no spaces. Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. My name is JT Wistersill, former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department. Excited to be joined on today's show by Mike Lagesholt. And Mike is someone who is the director of the annual giving for the University of Utah. He's been a part of the communication staff. He's one of my mentors as well, going back from my days as a student intern. So always great to have you join us, Mike. And what I'm really excited to dive into today is Cam Rising as it pertains to his all-time legacy at Utah. Because even if he hadn't played another down for Utah, which is what we're going to top and talk about right now, I still think his legacy is is incredible with what he's accomplished because you're talking about a guy who's already thrown for 5,572 yards, rushed for over 953 yards, has 58 total touchdowns. But what's most impressive to me outside of even just the numbers lags is his ability to just find ways to win and just the plays he makes in the biggest moments, right? The back-to-back Pac-12 championships, that special night against USC, what Utah did against Oregon inside Rice-Eccles Stadium. He's 18-6. and six. As a starting quarterback at Utah, it's already the fifth most all time. It's been an incredible career for him, and he simply put one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play up on the hill. No question. And, JT, great to be with you, and uh, glad to see you're doing so well. But uh, I, I can't take credit for anything you've done, by the way. It's it's okay. all you. So, But uh, proud to say I knew you when. But, you know, it's it's what? It's middle of February, late February. This is a great chance to, to talk about stuff like this and – and you're right, you know, we had some conversation about where does Cam rank all time before last season started. He never played, which I think will work out to be to his benefit as much as he made me want to come back last year. Yes. With the, and these procedures turn out to be as, as extensive as his was. Uh, to push and come back and play as much as you maybe want to for him, as much as the fans want him back, as much as Coach Witt want him back. I, I think to take another really essentially full calendar year from you know last September to this September almost before he plays the game is going to be smart push to get spring ball with uh, you know some guys that are new to the team or some new receivers and so forth to work with and so I think it's going to set him up better for success this year as much as he wanted to play last year um, I think it's going to work out for the best for him but yeah you look at his numbers and you, you read off some pretty impressive stats he's already accumulated and I just want to mention we got high school basketball championships going on in the Husband Center today. So if you hear uh, some crowd noise or some cheerleaders or PA announcer, I don't have sports effects going in my office all day long just to kind of give me the mood. This is live stuff we got going on. So uh, apologize for the background noise. It just kind of adds to the ambiance. But um, but back to the football stuff, his numbers are, are pretty impressive. And and you look at where he is, what, what he's done. But also what we could do this year, um, I think you look at his 22 numbers, you know, 26 touchdown passes. Um, he, he added uh, six more touchdowns on the ground. That's 32 touchdowns, total touchdowns. So as I started to break this down, I looked at total touchdowns. you got Alex Smith, who is really number five on that list with 62 total touchdowns. But come on. I mean, the guy was, you know, in the, the Heisman contention, uh, played, what, 16 years in the NFL, led the team to an undefeated season in the Fiesta Bowl. So I'll, I'll just tell you right now to, to end the drama, Alex is my number one guy. I don't see Cam catching him unless he really does the things above and beyond what we project. But then you get down to kind of that two through six. That's where this really got interesting to me. You look at a guy like Travis Wilson, um, you know, maligned by fans. They won him more. He had a tough act to follow with, with Alex Smith and with Brian Johnson. But Travis Wilson, number one all time, in total touchdowns, running and throwing the ball was 75. Um, he did not make my top five. I'll just say that right now. So then you go to a guy like Scott Mitchell, okay? Number two in total touchdowns was 72. 
pretty impressive numbers. He played for some teams that Jim Fossil had that weren't very good all around. The offense was terrific. Scott, you know, played in the NFL. He's a legit guy, put up impressive numbers, more of a stand in the pocket, throw the ball downfield, but did it with the best of them in that era. So you go from a, a Scott Mitchell to then a Brian Johnson. Number three in total touchdowns was 69. You know, Brian played after Alex Smith, so he came in, played 05, 06. I remember the first game I broadcast as a play-by-play announcer, voice the Utah 07 at Oregon State. He gets hurt in that game, came back, uh, played the rest of the 07 season late, but the shoulder just wasn't the same. And that, that kind of led into his 08 season. So I tell people his numbers were good. Yes, they went to Sugar Bowl, but Brian wasn't what Brian, I think, could have been that last year and a half pre-shoulder injury, if that makes sense. He just couldn't get the ball downfield as well as he could early in his career. So you take what should have been his prime years in terms of experience, knowing the offense, you know, just experience in the game. It didn't quite materialize, but still undefeated season. And now number three in total touchdowns is 69. You've got Tyler Huntley, number four in total touchdowns with 63. And then you get to Alex Smith with number five on that list. But um, I, I, the guy I didn't talk about was Cam Rising. He's already got 58 total touchdowns in his career. That will put him uh, just outside that top five, but then he project what he could do with 30 more this year. That give him 88 total, which would be by far the yes. most in school history. So I think 30 is a kind of a good number to go for. So right there, assuming he does what he's done in terms of touchdowns and productivity on the ground and throwing, he'll be the top guy all the time in school history and total touchdowns. Then you go to another number that coach will like to talk about, especially when it comes to defense, which is pass efficiency. And that, kind of combines a bunch of things that are pretty important, not just total touchdowns, not just yards. It's really your efficiency. So right now, Alex Smith, number one in school history, Tyler Huntley, number two, Cam Rising, number three. So you look at Cam and you assume, okay, he's probably going to maintain the pace he had the first two years. If not, I'll do that. And as you know, JT, guys get more experience. Um, it's his familiarity of the offense. It's just experience of seeing things, knowing how to handle it the first time, what they can improve on. Normally those numbers go up as a, as a career progresses. So to see Cam already number three, I think he will at least stay there um, with Huntley at two, Alex Smith with one. You go on down the line, you got Mike McCoy, a guy who played for Utah's uh, top 10 team back in 94. He's ranked number five. McCoy, former head coach in the NFL, pretty smart guy, good skill set as well. Not a huge numbers, but at that point, Utah had some terrific running backs. They always had a guy from the JUCOs, JT. Jamal Anderson was one that comes to mind. Yes. Uh, some other guys, uh, Ron McBride always had lines and running backs to go through quarterbacks. So your QB wasn't expected to do as much as they are now. And that was really before the QB run game became a big thing. Yeah. So McCoy's numbers maybe don't hold up in comparison to guys like uh, Brian Johnson and Alex Smith and uh, Cam Rising. But for, for that era, he was really, really good. So I've got him kind of in my top five. Um, you look at Scott Mitchell, his pass efficiency rating was number 10. But then, you know, guys threw more picks then. The, the, uh, the emphasis on taking care of the ball was a little bit less, and he had some teams that weren't very yeah. good. I'm sure, you know, Jim Foss said, listen, big guy, just chuck it downfield. We'll see what happens, you know. And he put up great numbers. So, you know, his numbers were kind of held back, and then he got Brian Johnson at number six in pass efficiency. So I combined uh, total TDs where I project Cam to be in plus pass efficiency. You got Cam at number two. Um, will be number one in total TDs, and then you got him number three in pass efficiency. To me, the combination of those two numbers, I got to put Cam with number two right behind Alex Smith. And then you factor in already two Pac-12 titles, two Rose Bowls, um, a, a chance to go into the Big 12 and, and you know maybe win the conference this year, maybe college football playoff. I just think, and, and again, you got to be careful, JT, as you know, by projecting things. Who knows what, what's going to happen this year? Um, but just looking at Cam's track record through the first two full years in 21 and 22, what he did, I think he's got a chance to have those numbers. And then you got to put him, I think, number two behind Alex Smith. I think you're absolutely right. I am curious really quick. I want to know if Cam did not play another down for Utah. We know he's going to in the fall, but he hasn't done it yet. Like you said, we're projecting. Where would you have Cam right now? So right now, Alex Smith, number one, um, I probably at that point would have – and here's why I had a hard time with Brian Johnson and Scott Mitchell. I, I think I would maybe put um, just based on numbers, Brian Johnson and, and the fact that he had an undefeated Sugar Bowl season, I probably got him number two, um, Scott Mitchell number three. And then I'm looking at kind of uh, probably Mike McCoy uh, after that. And then you got Tyler Huntley in there. So, yeah, Cam's career ended 
um, after that 22 season, which, you know, pre NIL maybe would have, you know, guys like yeah. him, I think would have been tempted to go and, and just get what money you can and, and see if you can make a team. But now with a chance to come back to campus and, and make some money as a player, which I think is great. Um, yes. It made it a lot easier for him to say, you know what, I'm coming back for one more year. And even last year when the injury held him out, it's like, well, I'll stick around for one more year. So yeah, had it ended there. I mean, yeah, two Rose Bowls. Um, I don't know that I really had a hard time with that. Alex Smith is the number one was really easy. Uh, but had had camps created after 22, I just felt like Brian Johnson probably still would have been my number two guy, Cam number three, and then uh, Scott Mitchell number four. It's a heated race and one I'm excited to give my thoughts on a little bit more in a moment because, like as you said, right now you have Cam outside the top five at this exact moment, eventually projecting him to rise up into that after what we think he's going to do this year. I'll tell you where I have Cam at the moment, and especially I think Cam is really going to be able to climb in 2024. We're going to dive into all of that in one moment, but first, I want to talk to you about Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you, and right now, all you get a hundred dollars off when they buy a big game ticket with code vegas 100 they have great last minute ticket flash deals zone deals any kind of deal basically you can find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area they have view from your seat so you know exactly what kind of a deal you are getting they also have their low price guarantee it's the game time guarantee this means you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section and row for less game time will credit you 110 percent of the difference game time even has deals on tickets right up to the start of an event even an hour after it starts it's the place to find last minute seats so you can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time right now all game time users get a hundred dollars off a big game ticket with code vegas 100 terms apply just download the game time app and use code v-e-g-a-s 100 for a hundred dollars off a big game ticket or you can use code locked on capital l and o no spaces for twenty dollars off your first purchase download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed also want to talk to you all about our friends at UCCU. Here's some exciting news. UCCU has just elevated their checking accounts by enhancing them with more benefits, more savings, and more online protections than ever before. A lot more paired with the most advanced and comprehensive mobile banking tools. Elevated checking is a must-have financial product packed with lifestyle security and financial benefits. The lifestyle benefits alone include cell phone protection, roadside assistance, telehealth with 24-7 access to licensed health professionals with zero copay, and exclusive savings on travel and shopping and plus dining an elevated checking is free when you do one of the following use your debit or credit card 15 times or more a month or make a monthly direct deposit of 500 dollars or more or maintain an average daily balance of 1500 otherwise uccu elevated checking is only six dollars a month visit uccu.com to open an elevated checking account online or stop by any branch to open an account uccu love where you bank Lags, you were talking about where you have Cam rising currently. I currently have Cam right now. I have him third. I put Cam just above Tyler Huntley to me. Scott Mitchell would be right behind him at fifth, probably Huntley for me. And that's very close as well. We can move those guys around however we'd like. To me, and I do still have, with ever, for everything you said, Brian Johnson, the wins, the big moments. Moments are something that's huge to me. Like It has to matter what you do, like you do against the Sugar Bowl and, and things like that, like we discussed with him and all of those amazing, just the abilities, the records, the moments. Brian Johnson, the all-time winning is quarterback for this team to me he had to earn the two spot right now and then i cam just behind it third mentioned the pac-12 championships just doing things this team hasn't done cam's also as is a guy who has 15 career games of 200 passing yards including two 300 yard games and one 400 yard game so that is currently where i have cam but as we have already articulated cam's not done yet he has an opportunity in 2024 to come back and set records he should become the winningest quarterback he's at 18 wins right now he needs nine to pass brian johnson's 28 he should be the all-time leader in completions for a utah quarterback over their career he's 218 completions away from the top spot and he had 249 like his last full healthy season if he's gonna fall a little short of that should still get there he should become the all-time leader in career touchdown passes too that was something you touched on he's currently 23 away from that he had 26 his last full year um, should be just continuing to rise up the rankings in so many regards. He's going to be a guy who's going to be second at all time passing yards. He's not going to be able to catch what Scott Mitchell did, but also just moving to the top three in rushing yards by a Utah quarterback. And of course, when we're talking about potential. I said winning in what you do in big moments. I expect right now, this is all projections. 
I think Cam is a really good shot to get Utah to the Big 12 championship. I think Cam is a really good shot to help Utah win that championship game. That means Utah gets to host a playoff game. And I talked about this a lot on yesterday's show, Lags. There are just not going to be a lot of teams, I think, that can come into Rice-Eccles Stadium and beat Utah. There's teams like maybe if it was a neutral site, that's where, yeah, I, I think that they could maybe knock off Utah. But coming into Rice-Eccles Stadium is a different animal. So Cam then could get Utah to the semis, one of the top four teams in college football, new heights they've never gotten to. So for me, Cam, he won't quite touch number one because even though Cam is – and he already is one of the most decorated, maybe the most decorated – in terms of accomplishments, he passed Alex Smith with some of those things, but the talent that Alex Smith was, I think that is where he is the best quarterback to ever play at the University of Utah from a talent standpoint, all those things. Cam will not touch him from that standpoint, but Cam could be the most decorated in a similar way. Like if I say Mahomes is the best I've ever seen, but maybe Tom Brady, you know, he won seven. That's just hard to do. That could be what we say with Cam, where it's like, well, he won back-to-back -back conference championships and, and maybe even a third during his time at Utah. That's just hard to do. That's where I think Cam lands at second all time for me. And man, I'm excited to see if he can set some of these lofty expectations, a lot of which are very realistic. Oh, yeah. No question. And going back to Alex Smith, I mean, they won the conference both years, mm -hmm. 03 and 04. Um, didn't start the first couple of games of the 03 year mm -hmm. when Urban came in in year one, but you're right. Uh, the numbers he put up in that 04 season, but had plenty of talent around him. He didn't have to carry a team like some QBs do. I mean, they had running backs. They had a fleet of receivers, this, you know, innovative offense and a defense that was locked down. But, you know, to me, Alex was, and you talk about things beyond just numbers and wins, the intangibles. He was so smart, so savvy, uh, just kind of a, a quiet uh, but strong leader that that he kind of just brought that whole thing together and his, able, or his ability to grasp the offense that, that Urban Meyer and Dan Mullen and Mike Sanford were putting in, which at that time was cutting edge, um, really just made him that extra that extra level of special. And, and the thing is, you know, I, I was thinking today, JT, as we talked about speculating, had NIL been around for Alex Smith, does he come back for that extra year, which he could have? I don't know if he does, because whenever you um, have a chance to be number, like a first-round draft pick for sure, but projected top five, top two, and he ended up being number one, what's the point of coming back and risk injury? So I just don't think he would have come back um, that that last year, like Cam had done. And cause Cam's not projected to be really a first round guy. Um, I've read some stuff on him and talked to people and very talented. I mean, I think he definitely has a chance to make a roster, but he's got some things to work on, you know, at the next level. So I think for him, it was a lot easier to say, you know, do I come back for one where you're at college, get some NIL money, or, or do I say I'm going to declare for the draft? I'll go in the draft. I'll go free agent and have a chance to make a team. Just a different decision-making process for Cam as compared to what Alex Smith had. It definitely was. And, you know, you make a huge point about just the NFL draft stock and style of things. Cam, guys in the NFL, like in throughout the draft process, they fall for the smallest medical things. When you're a guy like Cam, who didn't even play his entire last season, like, and then if you're doing, and we could even rope like a Brant Heath into this, right? Like how long he didn't play either. That's where I felt like it was definitely the best decision for these guys to come back and allow themselves yeah. that time to get their stock back and right. And we'll see what they can do and go from there and just showing their ability and health and proving whether it's Cam, like, yes, he's not going to be a first round quarterback. So it's what can you contribute? And I don't expect him. He has an uphill battle right now to be drafted, even as a day two guy, kind of be that day three, if he goes undrafted as well, Brant's another guy. We'll see what those guys can do health wise and what they can accomplish as well. But um, yeah, it is something where Cam, it feels like he's in a great position to land second all time too. And lags just kind of as you articulated so well too, I thought it's really cool to dive back and look at the rich quarterback history that Utah has. It's not surprisingly rich. So JT, I mean, yeah. think about the history of Utah football really till Ron McBride got here, you know, late eighties, early nineties to get this thing rolling. That 94 season was a breakthrough. I believe they went 10 and two that year, beat Arizona in the, in the freedom bowl. That was the best Utah could do at that point with, you know, uh, a nine, 10 win team is go with the freedom bowl and play Arizona, but it turned out to be heck of a game against that desert swarm defense. But that, that game put the program in the map. And for guys like urban Meyer, you know, who were looking at things even early 2000s, you know, Utah had some up and down years under Ronnie Mack, but uh, I'll tell anybody who will listen, I've heard this from others as well, without Ronnie Mack, there is no Urban Meyer, there's yep. no Kyle Whittingham. Uh, he he was a guy who took the time to build the foundation, 
whenever you're building something, it's going to be a little bit uneven. So there's some really good years for Ronnie Mack, you know, um, but towards the end, it certainly seemed like it was starting to fade a bit and they made a decision to go another to with another guy. And then urban comes in and catches lightning in the bottle. But you look at urban bringing, we're not really bringing in. I mean, Alex Smith was recruited by Ron and Bright and that yeah. staff. So that was a pretty nice gift that they left him uh, as well as some talented receivers. But then because Alex was here, you got Brian Johnson, you know, Brian was out of that mold of, of Alex. And so and Brian kind of carried you through. And the thing is, you know, I mentioned Travis Wilson earlier, people just, yeah, I don't know what it was about Travis. I mean, he's this big, tall, lanky guy looked uncomfortable running the ball, but was very effective. And that guy was a gamer, you know, put up some great numbers, start a lot of games. Um, unfortunate for him that the talent level around him, and the depth wasn't as good as it needed to be to win more games early on in the Pac-12 uh, era, you know, kind of late Mountain West days for Utah at that point. So um, as, that, as that program was growing under under Kyle Whittingham, it just just quite wasn't there. And then Tyler, Tyler Huntley, another guy who won a lot of games. I mean, they made back-to-back Pac-12 championship games. He didn't play in 18. Um, I think they could have beaten Washington had he been playing. And then they ran into an Oregon team that was red hot in 19. Utah got the bad start, just had kind of a collective loss. Uh, that, that was really frustrating for a lot of fans. They thought, okay, we got a chance for playoff berth, and it just didn't happen. But, you know, Tyler has some really good numbers. I just, But just watching those guys play, uh, from what I saw from Tyler, what I saw from Alex, what I saw from Brian, what we're seeing from Cam, I, I just felt like when you measure the intangibles and the way they elevated people around them, I think – Guys like Cam and Alex did more than like a guy like Tyler Huntley did, if that makes sense. And so didn't have him as high as maybe his numbers would have suggested. Still very talented quarterback. Yeah. Um, you know, but as you mentioned, this long lineage now, QBs at Utah, of all places, it's, it's pretty impressive. And Tyler certainly was a part of that. It very much so is. A lot of these guys underrated for what they did collegiately, and that's why it's fun to be able to do stuff like this where just because – and I know sometimes when you do these rankings and lists like, oh, you have this guy ahead of that guy, we're shading that. All of these guys are tremendous. There's so many different ways you could sort them out like that, and I think it's a fun discussion to be had. And it's going to be interesting to see if Cam can accomplish everything we talked about because Utah football does have a decorated history of quarterbacks. You know what's another decorated program at the University of Utah is the Utah Gymnastics Program. And Lags, of course, you are the voice of the gymnastics program, so I want to talk about their season so far with you you in one moment but first want to talk to all of you about our friends at FanDuel Sportsbook. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. It's capital L-N-O, no spaces, locked on, and you can shoot your shot. FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NBA and the NBA season continues to roll on, whether it's betting on jazz games or, of course, so much great action around the association. FanDuel is your one-stop shop. Whether you think LeBron's going to explode for a big night, do you think some under-the-radar teams like maybe in Orlando, Magic, the New York Knicks are always got a spotlight on them, what are they all going to do? Head over to FanDuel today to check it out and get in on the action. Lags, the Utah gymnastics team is off to another great start this season. Nine and three, the record overall for them. Coming off a win against Stanford, you as the voice for them. I'm curious on your thoughts of their season so far and just what you think this Red Rocks team has the chance to accomplish this season. You know, I'll spend a little on even for them, which is kind of what we thought, you know, with the coaching change and yes. uh, things going on in the offseason. I don't want to, you know, get too deep into that. I think our, our fan base that people have talked to, like we've heard enough, it's all about what's going on and and we wish Tom Farn the best. And But, you know, for Clyde Dockendorf, you know, former assistant, was the interim head coach. He wasn't named the permanent head coach until early December. And at that point, that's when things finally started to calm down. You know, whenever there's a coaching change, JT, whether you have an assistant elevated to a head coach or a new head coach comes in, it, it takes some time. You know, if you're uh, a former head coach coming in, you still need to kind of learn your your roster. You know, if you've been an assistant coach, you know your roster, but you've got to change your voice a little bit, uh, so to speak. You've got to take on a different role than you had as an assistant coach. And that just takes time. And I think for Carly, not to get the job until you know really a month before the year starts. It was just tough on her to to really have some time to kind of figure out what does she want to say, how does she want to say it. 
um, how to get this team ready for meets. And, and it's just been a lot of distractions in the offseason. They just did not handle that 14 meet, the Sprouts Collegiate Quad out, the Maverick Center, that Oklahoma, LSU, and UCLA very well. They, they just weren't ready to go that day in that kind of an environment. But they learned some things I think will help them out as they get into uh, you know postseason competition in April at regionals and nationals. But they, they kind of found their footing, I think, the last few weeks. They had a great score of Washington a few weeks ago on the road, uh, which is always good to do after a stretch of home meets. Had a season high score of 198 plus against uh, Stanford on Friday. Right now, number four in the rankings. But I got to tell you, the surprise team right now to me is the Cal Bears. In the preseason Pac-12 rankings, you had Utah and UCLA kind of separating themselves. And then there's Cal kind of back their ways. And all of a sudden, they start putting out big scores in week one. And you're like, well, can they maintain this? And they have. But they've been very consistent. Right now, their national qualifying score is 197-81. Utah, 197-645. So, you know, a little bit of separation about roughly, you know, 17 hundreds, uh, which is a small, but it's not over can't overcome either. But I've just been very impressed by by what they've done. You know, that coaching staff has, has been there, um, I want to say close to 10 years, something in that neighborhood. And and it kind of slowly built it, you know, in terms of talent. And, and I think this could be a breakthrough year for Cal. Uh, for their gymnastics program, and, and Utah plays against them or competes against them this weekend in Berkeley. So you talk about playing uh, or competing against a team that's ahead of you in the rankings, a, a team on the road. I think we'll find out a lot about both Utah and Cal this weekend. They have a team like Utah come in, and you're like, okay, this is a name brand. They are established. They're in our building. How does Cal handle that? How does Utah handle being on the road? And it's sort of uh, an underdog situation, which I haven't been in too many times since they moved to the, the Pac-12 conference. No, they haven't. It's a big test, and it's going to be exciting to see what Utah can do the rest of the season. And Lags, obviously not just with Utah Gymnastics, but you also are involved with the Crimson Club. Tell me about some of the exciting stuff you guys have coming up there. Well, we have a highly successful year-end campaign. We had a goal of raising uh, the funds to cover a over seven scholarships. We we tripled that and and went way beyond what we were hoping. So I just want to take a moment to say thank you to all of our supporters who gave. And, and I told people it's not just about the six-figure gifts. It's, it's three- and four-figure gifts that all add up. And we had a lot of people give. 100 bucks, $500. They did what they could to be a part of it. And, and uh, all that money goes to scholarships and supporting our student athletes. And in this age of NIL, where, yes, that is important. If you want to have competitive teams, you've got to do well in the NIL business as well. But really, scholarships and student athletes and supporting them and their goals to get a degree is, is really still the backbone of what we do. So, you know, that was big force. We've got our annual fund for the university coming up uh, annual giving day, April 2nd and 3rd. And we'll be raising money for youth with wings as part of that. And, and also with, uh, you know, football, spring ball uh, almost upon us in the spring game and so forth. We, we are renewing football season tickets and, you know, we had to, to raise our, our prices and, you know, we, we kind of told people what we're doing and, and, you know, I, the people out there who are, are uh, you know, not happy, listen, I get it. Uh, you know, money can be tight for a lot of us and, and that uh, we appreciate your support. We've been sold out every game since 2010. But I'll say this as well. It wasn't a decision that was arrived upon lightly. There was a lot of data that went into looking at uh, what we were charging and where and what they thought the market dictated. But really what it came down to for us, JT, is if we want to be a football program that has a chance to make the football playoff every year, be in that top 12. If you want to be top three in the Learfield Directors Cup every year, like we were a couple years ago, um, the cost of doing business has just gone up and we yeah. just felt as we looked at things, you know, we're, we're working to raise money in other areas as well. Our, our development staff and, and our sponsorships groups are, are just working tirelessly to, to help us. But that, you know, based upon some data we had and looking at the market, we thought there's a chance to raise some prices a bit and, and really help our entire department, not just football. So um, it's, it's tough. I know for some, but really if we want to be where we've been and continue to stay there and elevate, it was just something that we had to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's I think that's totally understandable, and I think a lot of people appreciate that explanation as well. Just like I greatly appreciate you stopping by, as always, Lags. Thank you so much. JC, always great to be with you. That is going to do it for today's edition of Locked On Utes. But we'll be back with you tomorrow, talking more things Utah football. We look forward to seeing you then.